welcome to episode six of War Stories. Today we are in Meadows, Utah. This is a really cool town. This is not like a traditional war. Um, this is more like the Shays Rebellion that we did in the last episode. And guys, we thank you for being patient with us on this next drop. We're going to do 10 episodes here, and then we're going to take four weeks off, then we'll drop 10 more. All right, so today's story actually begins in 1844. And Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon faith. And that part is not as important to the story, but what is important is Joseph received a lot of ridicule because of his faith, his beliefs, and what he was sharing with the world. And kind of similar to the situation in New York right now, Joseph Smith was actually put in jail. The young republic we were took our hands into a democratic action. And a mob formed outside the courthouse in Carthage, Illinois. And they killed Joseph and Hiram Smith. And it pretty much made them martyrs for the, the event here. So now let's, let's kind of go through the t a two-year period where the Mormon leaders were having some difficulties with people. Right. Uh, and not, not their people. No. But I'm talking the federal government. Right, because they were, the federal government was after them for the ligamy. Right, and, and not only that though, see, Joseph Smith had a, for the time he had what was considered a very radical opinion, that, you know, the Lord appeared in America, and, you know, there's a story that goes with that, and it's no different than other faiths that have their own story. Exactly. So. All of this could have been avoided. Two years, they're having these difficulties. And eventually, the Mormon leaders decide, you know what, we're just not going to have any tolerance here in the East. Mm -hmm. The United States still had this huge territory out West. Right. No states yet, just territory. That's important. So the leaders decide, okay, well, we're going to head West. And they took their followers with them. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1846. To, well, you tell why they made this trip and what their plans were. Well, in 1846, the Mormon saints left the east, heading west into Utah so they could start settling that and heading in toward uh, Salt Lake City. And then he was talking about problems with the government. And they had passed the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act um, in 1862. But before that, when all of this was still going on, the federal government was already coming against them for um, polygamy and trying to chase them down. And the reason, a lot of the reason why um, they wanted to go west was to flee that persecution. We came over here to the United States for the same reason, for freedom of worship and freedom of religion. And the state's rights and their rights, wanting well, freedom of religion, drove them west. Hey, 1857. So the group has been in Utah for about a decade now. And, and, and again, the Utah Territory. Right, not a state yet. They're setting up their laws. Mm -hmm. They're getting things organized. Well, in 1850 also, Brigham Young was appointed governor. They said they became a state in 1849. The state of Deseret made part of the compromise of the U.S. And then in 1850, they renamed Utah, made it a U.S. Territory. That's when he was appointed governor. He was appointed governor of the territory. Right. But again, the key word is territory. Right. And in those times, a territory, kind of like the Virgin Islands is a territory. Puerto Rico is a territory today. Yes. They get all of the same benefits as the United States. They're just exempt from paying the taxes that we pay. Yeah. And I, and I have a different issue with that. <laughs> but, but, but that's neither here nor there. So where we are right now, we have James Buchanan, 1857. He decides in, uh, in his own words that they're just becoming too radical. Well, why were they becoming too radical? If you think about it, okay, in 1852, let's go back just a step. All right. Of why he thought they were radical. In 1852, Brigham Young publicly announced that they were going to be doing polygamy. Kind of like telling the government, I don't care what you say, this is what we're going to do. And, it, you know, it was a public announcement, right? Then 1853, 
a Mormon sect projects Brigham Young and polygamy and reorganize their beliefs led by uh, Joseph Smith's direct descendants. But but their core values were the same. Right. Their core values were the same, and the differences there were, you know, should a man be allowed to have more than one wife? So Buchanan actually said that Utah was in a state of continual rebellion. Right. Now. Who else does that sound like right now, though? I'm just saying. Sorry. Well, I, right. I mean, there's a lot of comparisons to then and now. Hey, guys. I just wanted to tell you, yes, we are in period dress. This is frontier clothing from um, the Mormon pioneers, how the pioneers were dressed. This is the ladies' dress. You see this? This is the ladies' dress, and that is the man's dress. Buchanan sends word that he wants to get the military out there. He's going to get the territory back in order. Okay. So he makes these arrangements. Now, at the same time he's making these arrangements, about a month later, the folks in Utah get word that one of their associates in Arkansas was murdered. So that adds hostilities. Now let's fast forward another month. Word hits Salt Lake City that the U.S. government is about to attack. Part of this, this party coming from the east out there is, let's look here, what's his name again? General William S. Harney. Now the neat thing about William Harney was he got the great nickname of Squaw Killer because he was very good at killing Indians. He did it without prejudice. Right. So now you have this man coming. You have this whole army heading in. So the settlers of this great town that was once here. It used to be Hamlet. And the residents of this great town now had to deal with the oncoming of U.S. troops, but they didn't know it. We're out here in the, um, in the meadow. You see the meadow, it stretches out like this. And we're out here in the meadow, right here. And th this one site is dedicated to the women. And the children that were massacred in the wagon train that come over. So we're walking out here to the uh, monument site. Trudging through snow, Alabama people, check it out. Look at that, I'm <laughs> deeper in my foot. This is not fun. It's about a decade earlier. Uh, as we mentioned, they were the, the Mormon people that were coming across the plains. Huh? And it was not an easy trek across the plains. Uh, they were coming across, they had to deal with indigenous peoples. And they kept getting attacked a lot. A lot. Then they had to deal with the cold weather, and a lot of times during these winters, they would have to sit up for a place and stay there for a while. And it took 10 years for them to get across. That's a long time to get across. A decade. I mean, that, that's moving your people, your equipment, everything you have. And this is, this says in honor remembrance, may we forever remember the women, children, and wounded who died near here on September 11th, 1857, as part of the Mountain Meadows Massacre. They were killed without just cause. Most lie in unmarked graves somewhere in the valley. Only 17 small children survived, and they were later reunited with their extended families in Arkansas. Okay. The one thing that really gets me on this is we had other uh, organized faithful groups, mm -hmm. the Amish. Yes. And the Quakers are the first two that came to mind when we were kind of talking about this and Jen and I were doing our research. Right. The thing that took me uh, is Jen did a little additional research about the Amish. Well, tell, tell us what the, what some of the differences. Well, the Amish and the Mormon Church both have deeply held spiritual and faith beliefs, right? And they both segregate themselves from the world somewhat, you know, try to keep themselves separate. As the Quakers. But the Amish and the Quakers do not believe in serving in the military. Right. Okay. And the Mormon faith do. They do believe in serving in the military. The Amish faith um, do not carry and believe in polygamy. The Mormon faith does. The Mormon faith will engage in 
government activities were the Amish until this election year. Let's let's make this clear. <laughs> yeah. Let's make this clear. Until this That's election right. Someone year, woke up the Amish. So. Right. <laughs> but until this election year, they stayed out of politics. So in looking at that, what I'm taking is in the 1840s, the government was like, okay, if you want to have your group and you don't want to participate and save this country when it needs saving, if you don't want to fight for your liberty, that's okay. And then there's another group that says, we're willing to give it all. all right. We're willing to fight to the last man for our liberty and our freedom with you. The only thing is, is we want you to respect our religious rights. Right. And what are what constitutional law? Right. Religious rights. Right. And Lincoln was one of the presidents that when he got into office, because he knew the Mormon believers and the men were volunteering for the military to fight on his side for him, for the country. So he wasn't going to persecute the uh, Mormon people about the polygamy laws. And he refused to do it. And another reason he refused to do it is because they wanted to package it in as a dual thing uh, on slavery and on polygamy and wanted him to approve it all above the board or deny it all above the board. He said, well, I'm just not going to do anything with it. He said, this slavery's wrong. That's the forced, you know, entrapment of someone and the forced labor of someone. And this is not. They're willingly doing this. So, and this is part of their religion. It's not, it's not the same thing. And so he refused to interact with them. If you've checked out any of our other videos, you'll notice we I did a uh, recent video on I Jake's not family. I am not out of this dress. I want to... I'm out of the dress. Video on Jacob Hamlin, um, who was very integral, and he probably single-handedly caused the U.S. government to have an issue uh, because of his dealings with the Indians. And it wasn't he wasn't a bad guy when he dealt with the Indians. He dealt with them more fair than anyone in history, I believe. Uh, he helped the Navajo get an entire nation back, the size of the state of Virginia. But check out that video. I'll put the link below. Uh, but you had other guys like uh, Covington, who came out to, uh, for his carpentry skill. Leary, the same way. So there was a lot of very important men out here. We talked about some of the key characters. You've checked out the other videos and you know who they are. So now we're getting ready and the massacres start to unfold. So 1857, all right, Brigham Young, he meets with the members of his church in Utah to discuss the federal army coming this way. I mean, he's, you know, they've really got something to happen. Oh, what is it? Never to be forgotten. Okay, this this little plaque right here is dedicated to um, the says their lives were taken prematurely and wrongly by Mormon militiamen in one of the most tragic episodes in Western American history. So it's the men and the boys that died here. The Fancher Baker drive train was headed this way. They arrived in Ute and Salt Lake City. Might even, might even be the same day that Young was addressing these folks about the army coming. So there was a miscommunication. Oh, you know? for sure. They didn't know that they were coming. So at the same time, the Fauci Baker wagon train arrives in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. uh, most people know it as the uh, Baker wagon train or even the Arkansas wagon train. Since most of the people were from Arkansas. Right. And these folks arrive in Salt Lake City. Great. They should arrive in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. But let's get something to eat. Let's refuel. Let's give these people some commerce mm -hmm. and get on our way. But could they do that? No. No. Because with them, they brought a group called the Wildcats. The Missouri Wildcats. And these guys, they lived up to their name. So the whole way through the territory, the drivetrain is harassing the indigenous people. They're harassing the Mormon people, and they're intimidating the women. And these people, they just needed to get out of town. So they actually, they were heading on their way. They're leaving town. Brigham Young pulls this guy, George Smith, over, and he says, hey, come here, come here, come here. we got to get a message down to everybody about the federal troops that's coming. Well, so Smith heads out. He's running down there, and he ends up camping just by coincidence. 
camping by the wagon train. Now, he stays to himself, but he overhears a lot of their conversation. One of the things they seem to be bragging about is uh, giving a poisoned ox animal to the native people, kind of like, you know, giving rats decon. It, it, it's horrible, unspeakable, but... So what did he do? He decides to go and tell the Native Americans what they're doing to him. Right. And uh, try to get the eight of the Native Americans on their side. But at this point, the Native Americans were still, you know, they... It's questionable whether that actually happened with the oxen. You know, if you look in the history, some say it did, some say it didn't. But as far as for, for our story, I'm going to say it did because that was common. And if you look at the history, if you actually kind of look some more in these wildcats, that's, that was their M.O. Right. Let's fast forward about a week. The Baker wagon train makes it all the way down to Cedar City. Beautiful Cedar City. If you've not been there, you need to check it out. It's or check the, our videos out on it. Now, while they're in Cedar City, they're causing problems again. They're doing all kinds of stuff down there. They happen to make a little bit of a brag about killing some LDS members. And the only reason they killed them was because of their faith. All right. It was a hate crime in that, those days. But, you know, we didn't use those words then. But it was. And then they proceeded to harass the town's mayor. But what they didn't know is that Cedar City's mayor was militia. Mm -hmm. He was a high-ranking militia official. So he calls out to one of his friends, William Dame. And Dame calls out to some other guys. Uh, Lee, what was Lee's first name? These guys, they call a few other guys. And what their plan was, let's get the native people with weapons and encourage the native people to attack. We've primed them up by saying, hey, these people are trying to kill you by poisoning you. Now, the original plan here, let's get the Indians to hyped up, let's give them guns, let's have them go in and kind of shake down the wagon train, steal their cattle, and kind of like you do when there's a guest in your home you don't want, you make it uncomfortable and they leave. And that's really what they were trying to do. I mean, these people have been through the state, they've caused all kinds of havoc and when you're trying to live in a peaceful society, the last thing you want is disorder. And that is all that they brought was yes, disorder. Right. And they couldn't have that in the company. They couldn't have that traveling with them. One thing that we have to remember is this small group of radicals now, and I'm talking the mayor of Cedar City is the starting point. Dame Lee, they were more on the line of radicals. Okay. They decided they were going to take matters into their own hand. But it wasn't as if the, the mayor could just go hop on the Internet and send a real quick email to Brigham and say, hey, what, what do I need to do down here? I got these people. What, what, what should we do with them? Right. He asked to make a decision right there. So the right only then. thing that could happen was the council of the town wrote a letter to Brigham to explain, hey, we got these people. They're not leaving. They're not moving on. They're causing all kinds of problems. What do we need to do? And now that letter's on its way. But it hasn't got to him yet. We're in September 1857. And the militia and the Paiutes attack the wagon train with casualties on both sides. Thinking that the wagon train's just going to up and leave, they didn't. They dug their heels in, they took the wagons, had a makeshift fort out of the wagons and supplies. They hunkered down ready to fight. It's Are you going to turn turn back, turn tail, and run after all that? You've, you've developed some fortitude and some strength and some perseverance, and you're determined to go forward. So you, you aren't going to let them stop you. They were going to stop that wagon train and, and end it and bring relief to the people. That's what it was really about, was ending the tyranny that these people were trying to bring to a peaceful community. Now, a second, more urgent letter is sent to Brigham Young because they've attacked. Now, Brigham Young has to deal with the attack on these settlers. They also send a letter to Lee, tell him to hold up. No more gunfire. It's over. It's done with. Furthermore, the council wanted them to protect the wagon train from the Paiute until Brigham Young had a chance to respond. Right. See, because there was internal struggles between the Paiutes and the militia at that point because the Paiutes wanted to move forward. 
they're just ready to get these guys out of here. You know, through all of the work of uh, Jacob Hamlin and these guys before, there was wonderful relations between the native people of this land and the Mormon community. Right, and they didn't want them anywhere around. That was the thing, get these people out of here. Indians were just ready to be done with it. The Paiute, they were just done. So we're gonna, right here, we're at the monument that they had set up for the Meadows Massacre victims and the wagon train. And I'm gonna still, I'm gonna continue the story as we, as we walk up to the monument. The day after the skirmishes and all that happened, they surrounded the wagon train. And the only way that they thought to get them out was to deceive them. They told them that they were gonna make a truce to come out, to bring everybody out of that and bring them all out and we expose them and they were going to kill everyone except the very small children and so what they did is the the mormon settlers thinking of course they're peaceful people they want to settle this peacefully they want to everybody to get along right these guys didn't want to get in trouble now brigham young this is the president essentially of their little territory has been brought in we have americans fighting americans the letter's on its way to Salt Lake City. Brigham Young, he sees this letter mm -hmm. and he's like, oh my God, I can't believe what these people are doing. Right. You know, he's like, I mean, I'm willing to bet he took his hat, threw it on the ground. And Cause he's like, he said, I want you to protect them, not hurt them. He immediately sent a letter. He had a letter that said, no, here's what you're going to do. You're going to stop fighting these people. You're going, you're going to protect them as you escort them out of the territory. So escorting them out of the territory wasn't even an option at this point. Oh, they just had to get safely escorted. But they, now. So they could get down to their settlements. What they didn't realize, or what Brigham Young didn't realize. A day earlier, when they had gave them a fake uh, truce, like a pact, it said, if you come out, we'll all talk about this, we'll make a truce. And so when all everybody came out from the wagon train that they've been fighting, you know, and home, digging in from, they killed and they massacred everyone except uh, 17 small children. The smallest of the children survived. And that was the only ones that survived. Part of it was, Dane and this other guy, Hyde, they, they met up to discuss this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what they were figuring is, number one, they didn't want to get in trouble. Number two, they didn't want to have the Mormons look negatively upon for that. See, but at the same time, you have people there that were saying, you know, hey, members of this wagon train are the same people, the same people that, that was in the mob on Joseph Smith, same people that killed the LDS members on the way down to Cedar City, and it was time to wipe them out. So. They were going to make justice for everyone involved. And that was more or less vigilante justice, but the same as Shay's Rebellion, there was a need for the government to act in a, an appropriate manner, and the government failed these people. No, I told you it was a hike up here to the lookout. No, it's just right there. Oh, I thought that was the lookout lookout. <laughs> Here it goes. We're here just talking about the surviving children. Right. See, because right after the war, right. or the skirmish, or whatever you want to call it, it, there was inquiries. See, because Brigham, Brigham Young's letter didn't arrive until a day after the massacre happened. Brigham Young had no idea it even occurred. All he knew was there was an initial skirmish. And in his mind, his letter, just his letter ended it, and these people are going to be out of the territory, and he'll just have to deal with the U.S. government for the little skirmish. And you remember, we talked about the Hamlin family. Right. Rachel Hamlin was in her summer home up here because the desert heat was too hot for her in the summer. So she was up here in her summer home, and they brought the surviving children to her house for her to aid and take care of. And then she took them home with her after that. And this is right here. She said, at length, between sundown and dark of the last day, I heard a firing greater than before and more distinct. This is the last, this is the time when the last of them were killed. 
in about an hour, a wagon drove up to our house containing 17 children in it, the most of them crying. One, a girl about a year old, Sarah Dunlap, had been shot through the arm, and another girl, about four years old, Sarah Baker, had been wounded in the ear. Their clothes were bloody, and the little girl who was shot through the arm could not well be moved. And she, she nursed and took care of all of them and took them home with her. So the massacre happened. You know, can't change it. It did. There were a lot of inquiries. The government got involved. And the children were all sent back home to their families. Uh, hopefully they had good families in Arkansas that took them. But if it wasn't meant for Rachel, she was the one that took care of them. Right. And nursed them back to hell and kept them with her until, until they got better, well enough to travel. Let's go up here to the lookout. This is the monument dedicated to the massacre and it talks about it. That's the leaders of the wagon train. Here you go. Look at this, guys. See that? Oh, this scenery is beautiful. <laughs> This could be considered like an exploration and a... Oh, but anyways, anyways, the children, the children were sent back to their families. Government inquiries continued. Now, in 18, 1859, Buchanan issues, and that's James Buchanan, president, he issues a warrant for Brigham Young's arrest. Yes, he does. Mountain Meadows Massacre Site. This is the Overlook Memorial. Let's see this. It's a beautiful overlook. Oh, oh my goodness. Wow, it's pretty up here. I'm stepping in snow. Isn't that beautiful? Here's the wall. And it talks about those believed to have been killed at or near the mountain meadows were these people right here listed. You see that? Yeah, I'm just kind of going to give everybody a little panoramic view of that. You can slow it down and check out the names if you like. I'm sure Jen had them up on Facebook. If you hadn't seen that, check our Facebook page. All right. These are the children that survived. And these are other names associated with the caravan. This is a beautiful place to come, guys, to pay homage to the uh, Mountain Meadows Massacre victims. So you yeah, really do need to, if you come out here, check out the Mountain Meadows Massacre site. The jury was hung, cases, charges, all dismissed. And before the government could do anything else about it, uh, 1861 rolled around and uh, the Southern United States was also having issues with rights and they declared war against the North for their freedom. Yeah. And then there was this 10 year gap where nothing happened. And I was kind of curious about that 10 year gap and Jennifer went and she did a little bit more research on why the 10 year gap was and it turned out to be Lincoln. Right. In 1875, they tried Lee for the Mount <coughs> Meadows Massacre. They put him on trial for it and it was a hung jury. Okay. Then in 1876, they retried him and this time they convicted him of murder. And then in 1877 in March, he was executed here at uh, the Mountain Meadows, uh, Mountain Meadows right here, where I was just showing you the monument. Okay, and then in 1879, the Supreme Court upheld the uh, Moral Act, talking about the against polygamy, reinstating that. And in 1882, the Edmund Act declared it a felony and said that if anybody participated in it, they lost their rights as citizens. Let's go back to the Amish and the Quakers. Yes. They wouldn't even fight to defend the country, yet they have the right to vote for one. Yes, they do. 
And so, I mean, I think there was a great injustice done there. Right, just because they were practicing polygamy, they said that they couldn't, um, they would be, if they were convicted and caught, that they, they would, uh, there was over a thousand of them convicted and caught. Okay, and right. if they were convicted of practicing polygamy, they lost all their rights. It was a felony. Just like today, if you have a felony on your record, you can't buy firearms, you can't vote. There's things that you can't do if but, you have a felony. Right, but like Shay's Rebellion, good things do come. Yes. Because what did the state of Utah do? They decriminalized it. Right. The same as many states right now. A, a lot of you don't know uh, that marijuana is still illegal, mm -hmm. according to the federal government in all 50 states. Right. But there are states like Arizona, New Mexico, Illinois, California, that have decriminalized it. Mm -hmm. And it's available to the general public. And that's essentially what the state of Utah did to protect to protect the rights and the religious freedoms of its citizens. What they were saying essentially was that you can't practice your religion the way you freely want to um, and serve God the way you freely want to because we don't agree with your methods. So if you do that, if you have more than one wife, then you're going to be convicted of a felony. I, in my opinion... The Arkansas Wildcats should have been relieved from the Baker wagon train. In other words, if I have a business and someone's causing problems, I kick them out by whatever means I need to. The wagon train should have done that. But in Gen X standards, in true Gen X standards, they allowed the Baker, they allowed the, the Arkansas Wildcats or Missouri Wildcats to FAFO. If you don't know what that is, uh -huh. look it up because that's really what happened. Now, there were a lot of people there that should not have died. There were a lot in that wagon train that were not party to the Wildcats. But guilt by association. The director, the owner, whatever you call yourself when you have a wagon train, you're the one that's fully responsible for everybody in that train. Everyone. And that means controlling the, and your camp has to behave. If they cause problem in town, you have to pay for the damages. If they break a law, they have to uh, amend for that. Some may call the militia at that time extreme, but I don't think they felt they were. And I'm sure they didn't just come up with this plan like hastily, like, hey, let's just go and wipe out a, a, a group of people. The Mormon people, the LDS church, promotes family and well-being. And that surely is not family and well-being. So what made those men come to terms that they had to do that? They were fighting for the freedom of their others when the U.S. government wouldn't step in and help. The reasons that all of this happened was just religious difference. Not about denomination. And it's all about, we all have one central faith and one central God, and we're all serving the same God. And we have to remember that and keep the hatred and the judgment out of it. We are a free nation founded on the rights of the individual. And part of those rights is the right to practice your religion. Like today, James Buchanan was a Democrat from Pennsylvania. The same as uh, Joe Biden is a Democrat from Pennsylvania. And if you look at the legacy that the two gentlemen are leaving, they're riding the same train. And had Buchanan simply just followed the constitutional law that the founders of this country set forth, the Meadows Massacre never would have happened. The Utah Wars never would have occurred. From Mountain Meadows, I'll see you next time. Oh no, oh no, grab my arm. I have mud. I have, I have, uh, I have, 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 I have,